Originating from a trip to London last summer, I made this painting. It's called To Wait As Balan Falls. Having completed it, I decided to explore it further, just through the drawn line. To do this, I turned to etching. Etching is a particularly difficult process because I have to work in reverse and I'm scratching through a ground over a copper plate. It's very unforgiving and I really don't know what I'm going to get until I pull the first print. The plate's begun here in the studio but it's completed in the workshop in London and it goes through a number of different states. I finally pulled this print which had both a complexity and rhythm that I thought was working. Just through the massing and density of lines, the print extends some of the morphic qualities of the painting, one thing becoming another, and printing itself accentuates that excitement of a new reality coming into being, as it's all revealed when that plate finally passes through the press. Alongside working on the print, I also made a new painting. This painting seemed to have its origins in the original work, or at least in a small section of that painting. But in fact, it goes right back to one of the first drawings that I made, and in particular, an acrylic on paper study. I often work in acrylic on paper, just with brown and blue acrylic, to quickly explore forms and ideas. And this study went through a number of different changes, finding new characters and new motifs. And the resulting oil painting has an autonomous identity quite different from the original painting. I call this painting The Milliner's Dream, and in the lower half there's a portrait of my wife, Gaynor, painted perhaps quite conventionally. But in the upper half, the space is so densely folded and so complex that it's quite unlike any kind of optical representation of our world. There are many profiles, many characters, different faces, some seen at a distance, some only just realised, and some in the foreground more complete. But everything is dependent on everything else to realise its form, such as the eye that doubles as a mouth, the tree in the building that also becomes a profile. And the totality of this configuration is rather like an absurd hat, worn by Gaynor, perhaps a vision that she shares with us as she drinks a cup of coffee over breakfast. The idea of a portrait extending its narrative through hats and headgear is certainly not unusual throughout art history. There's some great examples, such as in Rembrandt's etchings, and of course that portrait painted by Matisse of his wife with that absurd hat. This is the territory of the Mad Hatter. But I didn't plan and plot these references from the outset. Quite the opposite. I simply engage in the process of painting and let that take me into new areas. But fundamental to this is an understanding and a manipulation of space and time that's quite different from the way space and time are usually measured to record our world. In effect, that replaces a collective consciousness where time and space are fixed with a unique consciousness where time and space can fold, change, adapt, and become whatever they want to be. There might be parallels with the dream state, but I'm not trying to illustrate a dream, rather like a veristic surrealist would have done. What I'm trying to do is to engage with the creative process that generates a unique reality, that's at odds with the ready-mades of social normalisation is at odds with the conventions of Euclidean measurement, of photography, of perspective, of digital mapping and of language. But the challenge is also to recognise that these apparently anarchic structures either work or they don't work, and that's not in accordance with self-expression or some kind of social or cultural consensus, but it's in accordance with an order that we don't really understand and at best stumble into, recognise, perhaps when we're in the studio. That's why I regard painting as a very special activity, an activity rather than an object, because it's an action that might just offer a route to uncover the unknown. All I can do is go back into the space of the studio and start over again, 
I can't conceive of difference at the outset. I can only work with what I know, both in terms of subject, the world around me, and the means of representation that I have as a craft. But through allowing the painting to grow in its own terms, all that is normal might just become subverted. This painting is just in its infancy, and at this stage it's full of potential. The paint is very thin and it lacks substance, but it's also very fluid and it's easily wiped away, and that can be replaced by new juxtapositions, new ideas. I currently call this painting Called as Ascension.